Devki Steel Mills have provided quality building material with the widest range of associated steel products over the last three decades. Look for the Devki mark on a wide selling reinforcement, twisted and DMT rebars, which are KBS certified and have the diamond mark of quality. Devki Steel, Kenya's most trusted steel company. Je, maumivu ya kichwa na kukosesha amani? Kaluma Strong utuliza maumivu ya kichwa, maumivu ya mwili na hata uondoa joto jingi mwilini. Kaluma Strong ina aspirin kama kiungo. Maumivu ya kizidi, muone daktari. Breastfeed your baby exclusively for the first 6 months of life. It helps them grow healthy and strong and protects them from infections and illnesses. Mothers with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 should be encouraged to initiate or continue to breastfeed while adhering to COVID-19 infection prevention and control measures to avert contact transmission of the virus to their infants and young children. Breast milk remains the best food and improves the baby's immunity. Breastfeeding is a foundation for a child's future health. Mothers who breastfeed reduce their risk of developing breast and ovarian cancers. Mavuno Fertilizers, a soil and crop specific fertilizer in Kenya, helps improve food security by improving crop yields through application of scientifically researched nutrition-based fertilizers. More than 500,000 farmers in Kenya can have easy access at affordable packs of 1 kg to 50 kg across major agro-dealers. Farmers who have used Mavuno Fertilizers have realized 30% more yield. Please feed your crop and soil with the best fertilizers for future prosperity. Call us today and learn how Mavuno Fertilizers is helping in increasing food production in Africa. This is NTV. on the CJ's advice to President Uhuru Kenyatta to dissolve Parliament. What will it really mean for Parliament and the nation at large? That's among our top stories on NTV tonight. Tonight, the Chief Justice ruled on the gender rule. But now, Parliament is ruling him out of order. Maraga has given the President a grenade when he has removed the pin. Riled about the prospects of an early election, Parliament is going off the rails. I dare say that if this Parliament is dissolved, the next election will bring more men. For the two hours of Parliament, as a resolved to engage counsel to immediately proceed to the High Court. Also tonight, where it all started going wrong for gender rights. Because the architecture was wrong. The false starts and the hurdles still ahead. These extraordinary circumstances will have played out that the 12th parliament uh, was extinguished uh, before its expiry date. Plus, President and his administration used the two-thirds gender principle to begin the undermining of the Constitution. Rights activist Daisy Amdani makes her case for the full implementation of the gender principle on tonight's big interview. And also tonight, I will answer you. It's a combination of dread and panic for some parents and teachers. Bring the child to school and go home and leave the child with us. <laughs> and the Education Ministry now wants schools serving as quarantine centres vacated. NTV Tonight 
with Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks for joining us. Flora Atieno is our sign language interpreter. Tonight, the National Assembly is divided on the constitutionality and practicality of Chief Justice David Maranga's advice to President Uhuru Kenyatta to dissolve Parliament for failing to enact laws that enable the implementation of the two-thirds principle. Some members argue that dissolving Parliament would be defeatist, while others are lauding the Chief Justice for what they term as a bold constitutional move. Leila Mohammed starts us off. The Commission has taken the firm position that the action by the Right Honourable Chief Justice to advise His Excellency the President to, as aforesaid is ill-advised, premature and unconstitutional. A house on edge reeling from the after effects of Chief Justice David Maraga's advice to the President seeking for the dissolution of Parliament for failing to enact the two-thirds gender principle. The Parliamentary Service Commission in furtherance of its constitutional mandate and on the request of the Speaker of the two Houses of Parliament has resolved to engage counsel to immediately proceed to the High Court pursuant to Article 165, Clause 3 of the Constitution to challenge the unlawful and unconstitutional action taken by the Right Honourable Chief Justice. It is a matter that has hit Parliament where it hurts and members have been debating its constitutionality Tuesday afternoon. As a house, we can't be under siege. We can't be under siege. I have seen people outside saying, oh, Parliament must go home. Go home where? We are going nowhere, Mr. Speaker. We are going nowhere. And the question I want to ask is one, even if we are to go to elections now, within 60 days, Mr. Speaker, how are we going to achieve the gender, the gender parity? Because Kenyans will still elect more men than women. It's for a fact, Mr. Speaker. I'm unable to agree with an interpretation that would precipitate a bigger constitutional crisis while trying to solve a small constitutional crisis. And it is on that reason that I believe that although the CJ has advised the president to dissolve parliament, that particular advice should not be adopted. The Speaker, if you look at Article 94.1, it also confers the legislative authority on parliament and that authority is derived from the people. The people who woke up at five, who voted for all of us. Why did they come with the provisions as it is in the Constitution? And that is why I think whether we say what, this principle, Mr. Speaker, I want to say it here. However, even if Maraga was to succeed by persuading the President to dissolve Parliament, you will dissolve this parliament a thousand times if you don't address this issue through a referendum. Even the Supreme Court itself, those judges, they do not subscribe to the truth of gender rule. And you know that, Mr. Speaker. And the many legislators who are shouting outside there, particularly our female colleagues, they should stop pretending, Mr. Speaker. We've been in this parliament, and the time of voting when it was here, they were away in New York. To gain allowances, Mr. Speaker, as opposed to advancing this. It is really shameful, Mr. Speaker, for those of you, if you push me, I'll mention your names. Because the two thirds was not achieved because of their selfish interests. Some, however, have welcomed the move. This matter is a matter for all of us. Mr. Speaker, it is for all of us to resolve it together. Parliament does not have to express itself only in one direction. Parliament can say a yes, and Parliament can say a no. And Parliament has said a no. And Parliament having said a no, the matter moves to a different authority. And the different authority here is the Chief Justice. Nobody abused Parliament when Parliament made its own decision. Leila Mohamed, NTV. Well, the move by Chief Justice David Maraga to advise President Uhuru Kenyatta to dissolve a parliament has raised a number of constitutional concerns that seem to have left both leaders and the electorate with more questions than answers. Vincent Odor spoke to a former member of the defunct Committee of Experts on the 2010 Constitution on what exactly this means for parliament and the nation at large. 
If President Uru Kenyatta takes the advice of Chief Justice David to dissolve Parliament, it will be the premature end of the 12th House. All the elected legislators, both in the National Assembly and Senate, would go back to the polls to seek a fresh mandate. By law, that election must be held within 60 days. Bobby Mkangi was a member of the Committee of Experts on Constitution Review. He says the Constitution is very clear on how the President should proceed. That's a, a direct command uh, and the President really does not have discretion around whether to dissolve or not. Uh, I think the only um, uh, leeway or gap that gives the President uh, some level of discretion is the fact that no categorical uh, period is indicated uh, in the con Constitution and particularly that provision as to when he must take that action. Among key constitutional questions is whether the dissolution and fresh election would affect all elective positions, including the presidency and devolved units. The Constitution states that elections for all positions will be held together on the same day. Mkangi argues that this isn't necessary based on the principle of separation of powers. No, the law says it's only parliament that's going to be dissolved. And that's why there was separation of powers. The election of governors, MCAs, uh, uh, and the president uh, shall still be anticipated to take place during the general election in August 2022. These extraordinary circumstances will have played out that the 12th parliament uh, was extinguished uh, before its expiry date. Uh, and so the new parliament that comes into play starts its duration uh, from the time uh, time starts ticking uh, when it comes into office. But House leaders say dissolving parliament will not resolve the problem. When you dissolve parliament, there must be an election within 60 days. How are you going to ensure that uh, the resulting parliament will be will be, will be two-thirds, not more than two-thirds of either gender. It's no way. I mean, this is all tired thinking. But as deliberations continue, observers argue that the president may use this as a political weapon to whip the house into shape. Uh, it's only through this activity and this scenario that the president can have some level of leeway. It will be left to be seen uh, whether the, the president will uh, take advantage of uh, this uh, uh, weapon, uh, of, 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 of this, uh, uh, you know, it's a carrot and stick situation, uh, that parliament does what it wants or he dissolves it. The executive has also yet to respond to the matter. Vincent Odur, NTV. Well, as discussions continue on the constitutionality of Chief Justice David Maraga's advice to President Uhuru Kenyatta, it is now emerging that achieving the two-thirds gender principle as prescribed by the Supreme Law was a tough ask from the start. Individuals and institutions involved in the constitution-making process over a decade ago argue that realizing this requirement for elective positions may need a different approach. Zainab Ismail has those details. The adoption of the 2010 constitution brought with it a radical change in the organization of the country's political institutions, key among them provisions for equitable gender representation. Article 27.8 provides that the state shall take legislative and other measures to implement the principle that no more than two-thirds of the members of elective or appointive bodies shall be of the same gender. A decade later, it remains just that, an idea on paper, more so for elective positions. And we've not been able to implement this as envisioned within the constitution. Why? Because the architecture was wrong. Once you have an architecture which says you will have uh, 
women only seats in 47 counties, then you have 290 constituencies which are uh, gender neutral, you can then have all the 200 and constitutions or constituencies occupied by one gender. We had pro provided for a system similar to what we now have in the counties, whereby parties would, would provide lists and you know, women would, would be drawn from those to ensure that we had at least um, one third. Now, what happened was that aspect was thrown out completely in Naivasha. The parliamentarians um, added 80, some 80 plus seats that fit the traditional system of first past the post. And so now we ended up with a National Assembly that was bloated. And then this was the one thing they said to us was non-negotiable. We ended up with a constitution that did not have an exact mechanism for ensuring the, the one third in the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. In 2012, the Supreme Court issued an advisory opinion that the gender principle be realized progressively, setting the 27th of August 2015 as a deadline for the enactment of suitable legislation. But all attempts by Parliament have failed. So whatever you do, you, the only the best thing that you can do is to have the 40, 47 women seats and the nominations. You won't achieve one third. And that is why we said and people did not listen to us at that time. Don't increase the constituencies. Leave the constituencies at, 20, at 210. Then the 90 seats be based on a party list, which must be man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, man, woman. Immediately you get 45 women. Right. Then you have women representation from the 47 counties. Immediately you have 47 plus 45. Immediately you have 92. Then you have nomination. You've resolved the issue. But on the basis of the present architecture of the constitution, the provisions dealing with people representation, you cannot achieve it. But the problem extends beyond parliament and to President Uhuru Kenyatta's cabinet, among other appointive positions. What has stopped President Uhuru Kenyatta from appointing 50-50? Women, 50 50% of women, 50% of men in his cabinet. That's not even a constitutional issue, by the way. It is an administrative issue. It's a leadership issue. President Paul Kagame of Rwanda has surpassed that. Many countries have done it. So sometimes, yes, you could try and be descriptive in a constitution. Describe, uh, prescribe how, what it must be done. But it also boils down that who are you entrusting to implement that constitution? So if you are entrusting, say, the implementation of this constitution to someone like President Uhuru, who clearly, with now two terms, doesn't believe in the idea of gender, because that's the truth. He doesn't believe in it. What has stopped him from, for example, uh, picking at least 30% of women? Constitutional lawyers, however, argue that achieving the principle in an environment of cultural defiance may be a tall order, more so under the current constitutional provisions. Zainab Ismail, NTV. Well, that uh, advice has certainly sparked debate amongst parliamentarians, but what do you think? Well, we also tooled around in search of your views on that proposal to dissolve Parliament over the two-thirds agenda principle. Here now is what you had to say. Sababu moja ambao inafanya bunge liwe, ni hili liweze kutengeneza sheria ambayo inakuwa inatumika katika hii inchi. Na wakati imeshindwa kufanya hivyo, basi ni kusema ya kwamba imekalia kazi ambayo si yake. Uamuzi wa maraga vienye ameamua sisi kama wa Kenya tufuate na uhuru Kenyata afuate sheria. Ile sheria ndio ilimweka nyumba ilimweka kwa hiyo kiti na hiyo sheria ndio itamtoa. Hii mbunge ninaoendelea naoendelea ni vizuri ifunjwe kwa sababu imekosa kutekeleza ile rule ya true that gender. Ile ingine, hii mbunge ukiangalia hata iwezi tekeleza ni vile they are not united ukiangalia uko ndani wana vita mingi kwa hivyo hawezi ongea luka moja tumechoka lakini sheria tunayotumika kwa mtu mdogo ikiguza mkubwa ni shida 
na vinye tunasikia mturi akisema hapa ati wanaenda kuapiro hiyo kesi sisi hatutaki kesi ipeleko ya supreme tunataka turetewe sisi wananchi mchango ya ya mwanamke aitambuliki katika nchi yetu ni kama baada wajakubali kana kwamba mwanamke na mwanamme penye walienda darasa walisoma pamoja na ajabu ni kwamba hata kuna wanawake wame wako na elimu ya juu kuliko wanamme. Hiyo challenge ni wanamme wanakataa kukubali. Na wanasahau kwamba penye mtoto wa kike anapatikana na amesoma. Pale maendeleo iko kwa wingi. Nikana kwamba wajali wa kwamba mama wanaweza kufanya kasi kwa bunge. Sasa inafaa ifunjwe tena tuanze tena upya wa mama wapatikana kwa bunge. Na unajua ukiinua mama umeinua jamii. All right, well, that is what you had to say. And at this point, we move focus now away from the gender agenda and to the Ministry of Education, which is asking the Ministry of Health to vacate schools that had been turned into quarantine and isolation centers before Monday, the 28th of September, when teachers are expected back. The Teachers Service Commission and the Kenya National Union of Teachers have also rolled out guidelines for teachers ahead of the much-talked-about reopening of schools. Leila Mohammed has that story. A day after an education stakeholders meeting resolved that teachers return to school Monday the 28th of September in preparation for reopening, the Kenya National Union of Teachers has begun rallying its members to comply with the directive. Let us not politicize, and I think we've done too much. We've done too much. We've made news about reopening of schools, when, how. Uh, I think we've done too much. And as I've stated, children are safer in schools than at home. Even if we were ordered to report tomorrow, Wednesday, and children to come back on Thursday, that one we are ready. You can be very sure. A circular sent out to directors of education by the TSC. Teachers are to work with other stakeholders to ensure general cleanliness of the school campuses, map out curriculum delivery timetables and schemes of work, development of innovative strategies and mechanisms for curriculum implementation while containing COVID-19. For the first time, our teachers will do an extra job. The teaching environment will be different. We will be doing more caring than even teaching. So you can be very sure there is hard work awaiting our teachers. Bring the child to school and go home and leave the child with us. <laughs> the rest uh, we will be able to handle. While the state retreated students to their homes after the COVID-19 pandemic hit, looking for a safer space, some of the children have been abused in their very own homes. Now with teachers insisting that it is time for them to go back to school where they will find peace and tranquility. While time away from school was for the safety of the learners, the period has been a nightmare for some. So the 1,145 cases of children received at the Gender Violence Recovery Center between March and August are just those who are treated at the Gender Violence Recovery Center where we work at the nine hospitals. Yeah, and those are just the children only who comprise of about 59.6% of the total cases that we've seen. The of pregnancies that we witnessed during this period cannot be compared to any other time. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all prepared. Forget about, forget about noises from elsewhere. Meanwhile, the Union of Non-Teaching Staff is now threatening industrial action over what they claim are unpaid dues that the Ministry of Education insists has been channeled to the respective schools. Leila Mohamed, NTV. The Ministry of Health will this week launch new protocols on management of dead bodies, a matter that has elicited various reactions since the outbreak of the coronavirus. This, the ministry says, is based on new findings showing transmissions from dead bodies as unlikely. The revised protocols will guide the conduct of burials that uphold the dignity of the deceased while minimizing excessive supervision by health ministry officials. The ministry believes that the protocols will also eliminate stigma by minimizing the high presence of health officials donning protective gear. 
Meanwhile, to the numbers now, and nine more patients have died from the disease, raising the death toll to 659. 139 more persons have tested positive out of a sample size of 1,774, and this raises the country's caseload to 37,218. 198 individuals have recovered, and the total number of recoveries stands at 24,147 of their loved ones who succumb to COVID-19. And in this regard, it will be no longer necessary for Ministry of Health teams to be dressed in full personal protective equipment to take over the burial ceremony while their relatives, friends and families watch from a distance with limited participation. So we still insist that those cultural beliefs where your bodies have to be kissed some are washing the bodies. Those ones are still prohibited. You are still not allowed to wash that body. It could still be infective. And once the body is uh, placed in that double bag and then placed in the, in the casket, you are not allowed to open that casket. All right, from that, we take a breather now on NTV tonight. And a reminder to you that today is World Rhino Day. Kenya ranks fourth in the list of countries with the highest number of rhinos in the world, with 794 rhinos counted at the end of 2019. Now, this footage coming up on your screens is of two extremely rare Javan rhinoceros calves spotted in an Indonesian national park. And this boosts the hope for the future of one of the world's most endangered mammals. Rhino populations in Kenya still remain under threat from poaching. When the world changed, it made us go back to the simple joys and love the little things even more, like serving up your best, eating together, and sharing more. Now, oh, we'll take nothing for granted. And always remember to taste the simple joys. Coca-Cola, taste the simple joys. All day, we expect our mouth to do all kinds of things. That is why it needs all-round protection. New Oral-B Pro Health Toothpaste. Its advanced technology helps prevent both tooth holes and gum problems that can lead to tooth loss. It strengthens your teeth, giving them all-round protection. Because your mouth is doing more than you think. New Oral-B Pro Health. All-round protection for your whole mouth. Devki Steel Mills have provided quality building material with the widest range of associated steel products over the last three decades. Look for the Devki mark on a wide setting reinforcement, twisted and TMT rebars, which are KBS certified and have the diamond mark of quality. Devki Steel, Kenya's most trusted steel company. Get fresh, got it. join us on this mission? Yes, but how? Just one question for you. How do you keep your toilet clean? I use regular detergent and bleach for washing and removing yellow stains. I've been using it for years. Oh, madam, the regular detergents and bleach are used for washing clothes. 
To disinfect your toilet properly, you need Hapik 10X. It is specially made for germs and stains removal. Hapik's thick formula settles on stains and gives 10 times better cleaning compared to regular detergents and bleach. Wow, now I'm convinced, Helen Paul. Really? Yeah. Now that she's part of the mission, the next house is yours. Citizens, my goal is to help bring prosperity to our town. I am here to file a candidacy for the position of governor. He's paying off the people. He's a cheater. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You don't have any shame. You cheater. I will make sure to do everything to stop you. Oh my gosh, Anna! Gal, help! Anna, you're pregnant. I'm telling you that getting rid of them will fix all our problems. Just get rid of both of them. Get rid of them right away! Welcome back to the broadcast. The National Assembly Health Committee says it will question officials of the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority, that's KEMSA, and the Public Procurement Regulatory Authority on the reverse procurement of COVID-19 protective equipment adopted by the agency and which has left billions worth of the goods lying idle in its warehouse. Gina Kirori was at the warehouse and now reports that the terms have now resulted in a payment dispute between the agency and its suppliers. A tussle between the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority and various suppliers of COVID-19 protective equipment has led to this. Three warehouses full of medical equipment worth over 6 billion shillings purchased by KEMSA. The National Assembly Health Committee, which visited the warehouse on Tuesday, says this is a problem of KEMSA's own causing. But KEMSA out of their own wisdom, which uh, we are trying to figure out at what point they, ar they, they, they arrived at the figure of buying things, goods worth 7.1 billion, decided to buy, outside what the ministry had authorized, they decided to buy items worth 7.1 billion, anticipating because of the numbers and the world figures that were happening on COVID, that they'll be able to buy those items and sell them. It is emerging that these supplies were acquired through a process known as reverse procurement, in which KEMSA sent out commitment letters to the companies and goods delivered before payment. The committee says it will investigate this, as well as how. The first batch of items is of those that were allowed for procurement by the Ministry of Health and which some of the money donated by the World Bank went into buying. And the second batch contains those that KEMSA procured from their own resources by their own wisdom despite not receiving authorization from the Ministry of Health. They have supplied, the items are here. They have not negotiated. So at what price are we talking about now with the current market prices? So that's one of the biggest dilemma and would be wanting an explanation from uh, the management and why they have also taken so long to negotiate with the suppliers and they have already received their items. The National Assembly Health Committee will now be looking into what the thinking was behind KEMSA's decision to purchase the 7.1 billion worth of personal protective equipment by analyzing the minutes of the meeting that yielded the decision. Gena Kirori, NTV, Nairobi. All right, back to the two-thirds agenda principle and that it stands out among key constitutional requirements of the 2010 law can never be in doubt. Four times Parliament has attempted at enacting provisions for its full implementation and four times the House has failed. Chief Justice David Maraga's shocker advising President Uhuru Kenyatta to dissolve Parliament is a result of constitutional pressure from various institutions. Daisy Amdani, a renowned women's rights activist, was part of a group that petitioned the court to urge the state to implement that principle. She sat down with NTV's Olive Burrows to talk about the constitution a decade on.
Thank you for joining us. We're now joined by women's rights activist Daisy Amdani, who's not new to our TV screens. Happy to have you with us. Thank you. Um, ten years in, we seem to be still struggling, especially where women are concerned, to meet that uh, gender threshold that has been set, that is the minimum requirement in the Constitution. Uh, with regards to the two-thirds, I think that uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta has been very disappointing. And I say very disappointing because he's a relatively young man. This is uh, a man who has been exposed to the world. He went to school abroad. So you don't expect um, him to embody the kind of patriarchal norms that were, were known to be, you know, um, uh, enshrined by people of an older age set. But we have seen a resistance on his part. Now, once upon a time, they argued we didn't have enough women because maybe women were not going to school or if they were, they were not getting high levels of education. But this argument cannot stand uh, today. We have very many qualified and overqualified uh, women. I mean, we've seen instances where his own administration actually appointed to the cabinet a standard three graduate. If they can are they called graduate I mean, somebody who had gone to standard three and and i'm not knocking it because i mean he said he came from a poor background and uh, you know he struggled and and that's very understandable because that is the story of many people but that a man he could actually pick a man with those kind with that level of qualification yet for women who if you look at even the cabinet the, even though it has not met the two-thirds gender rule you will find that the women are very, very qualified. The women who sit in cabinet are overqualified, you know. You, there would be no concessions made for women who did not have the kind of qualifications like they do for men. But we have seen a resistance on his part. And, and he cannot say that it is because there is no legislation, because you don't need legislation for appointments. Appointments is just a matter of numbers. The president's cabinet is not compliant with the two-thirds gender principle. We went to court in his first term. We got orders requiring that the next cabinet that comes into place, because we were eight months to the election at the time of the petition, that the next cabinet that comes in must comply with the two-thirds gender principle. He did not comply. He has not complied. To date, the cabinet remains uh, improperly constituted. The civil service, parastatal appointments, diplomatic corps. So by demonstration, what he is showing us is he actually does not appreciate the principle of inclusivity when it comes to women. We look at parliament. Parliament has not implemented the two-thirds gender principle, despite the fact that they have tried by bringing in the bill. Now for me, we have seen when the president wants pe uh, legislation to pass, he whips the members, and even sometimes uses force. We saw what happened with the security laws. They deployed uh, military to parliament with tankers as though they were going to war. But we have not seen this. If anything, we have seen excuses. Uh, the cost, you know, is too expensive. You remember the wage bill debate. You remember the Mutambu bill that came up in 2014 that was seeking to address the wage bill. And one of the exacerbating factors, they said, was overrepresentation exacerbated by the two-thirds gender principle. We commissioned a study that was uh, carried out by the IEA, which found that actually the cost of implementing the two-thirds gender principle was 57 shillings per year per taxpaying Kenyan. So the cost issue is not an issue. Nevertheless, even after they have not implemented it, see what they have done with our budgets. We are in crippling debt as a country. So you can't say that overrepresentation is the issue. It's just public finance mismanagement. So we have seen a complete refusal. And I always tell people that I personally believe that the president and his administration used the two-thirds gender p uh, principle to begin the undermining of the Constitution. Because if they could successfully exclude half of the population, and begin to unravel the constitution. Because remember, the first court order that has been disobeyed in Kenya post-2010 and under the first administration elected under the new constitution is the issue of the two-thirds gender principle. And they left it to us as women to fight for the implementation. Every court order that has been given 
with regards to the two-thirds gender principle has been ignored. But now look at what has happened. With the disobedience on the two-thirds gender rule, everything began to unravel. The president actually does as he feels whatever day he wakes up. So you don't buy into this argument that uh, adding women representatives uh, to parliament and now nominating female MCAs to meet the minimum two-thirds is a valid argument that we are overrepresented. We're not. In fact, the nominations, listen, first of all, let us, let me say this. Article 177B of the Constitution that calls for special seat members necessary to ensure not more than two-thirds of the same gender presumes that Article 81B will have been met. Now, Article 81B is the principle, the principles by which the electoral process is supposed to abide by. Meaning that within the Elections Act and the Political Parties Act, there must be mechanisms to ensure not more than two-thirds of the same gender for elective public offices. So that when lists are being submitted for election, so through the nomination process, you should at least have mechanisms that work towards ensuring not more than two-thirds of the same gender. Then, having done all you can, to ensure not more than two-thirds of the same gender but then fall short, then you nominate. That's actually what that mechanism is there for. So it's not for the purposes of nominating so that women are there. It's for the purposes of nominating in the event we do not achieve the threshold through the elective process, having done all we can. But what they have done, the political parties, is they have not put in place any mechanisms. There is no political party that has put mechanisms to ensure in their party primaries, as they do the nomination process for the elections, that at least they strive to ensure that at least a third of members on the ballot, candidates now, those who will be candidates, who will be people will be voting for, are of the opposite gender. They have, they have not done it. So the effect is that we have to top up. And then they come and they complain and they say, see, we now have, women are just coming to fill the spaces. So what they do is they create, the, they create bottlenecks and then they complain. They complain and say, see now, you know, the women are their own worst enemies. They don't come. But every party leader... It's interesting uh, that you say that because there are those who argue that if you tell us the, the women... Uh, you said half mm. of Kenyans, Yes. then why can't they elect themselves? Since the history of Kenya, when did women start getting elected? How many women have we had in positions of power? That tells you that the system, it's a systemic thing because we have patriarchal systems, tribal systems that do not recognize the place of women, where women live on the margins. So women were not inheriting. Look at how much it costs even to run an election, just to put money to an election. Forget about all the other problems that we talk about in an election, you know, the bribery and whatever. But even the cost of just running an election. Where are women going to get that disposable income to be able to put towards mounting a campaign? We are not, we don't make it easy for them, just the same way with youth also, you know, where the nomination fees are very high, you know, the cost of running a campaign. So the, the Constitution actually recognizes that these people have been marginalized because of practices, because of culture, because of tradition. You can imagine that there are places in this country where if it was left to chance, no woman would be elected. Places where they engage in negotiated democracy. And that negotiated democracy is negotiated by elders, of whom none are women, of whom embody the ideology that women have no right to leadership. But because the law, the supreme law of the land, the constitution requires, whatever the case, you will have somebody coming out of that region that must be female, elected for this seat. They have no two ways about it. It also has the effect of beginning to re-socialize people to the idea of women as leaders. You're asking, you know, where will women get their disposable income to make a run for office given the fees and all that. So is that why you're saying that political parties need to make more of a conscious effort to get more female names on the ballot? Even right now, if you look at all the women who have been elected thus far um, during this dispensation, they have been elected on political parties that are dominant in the areas they come from. And so they have won their party, apart from one independent candidate who herself was a popular candidate, the MP for Turbo. 
the Katiba Institute went to court in the run-up to the 2017 general election seeking to have the court compel political parties to meet the two-thirds gender rule. But because the elections were still underway, the nominations had already started, the court did rule in favor of them and ordered that the ORPP and IBC have a duty as independent institutions to implement the constitution. And, and therefore, they cannot f decide that because parliament has not passed the necessary uh, legislation, that they, their hands are tied. Because the constitution says policy, legislative programs, and other measures. So they said, take other measures. But you have a responsibility to the constitution and to ensure that political parties abide by the constitution. So ideally, now hoping for 2022, IBC should be able to reject any list for election that does not meet the two-thirds gender rule. But the political parties hold the key and they must demonstrate. They must demonstrate it. They cannot be here in the congregation of mourners telling us we don't know what to do when they are the ones who hold the key and they are, they've locked the door. So even this thing of saying that women are their own worst enemies, this is a lie because how many women are party leaders? How many women are party leaders? Those men leaders who tell us by words that they are very committed. The president has told us he's very committed, mm. but there is no mechanism in the Jubilee party. The uh, former prime minister has told us he's very committed, but there is no mechanism in the ODM party. Uh, Kalonzo has told us that uh, he's very committed. In fact, him, he says as wiper, we are for 50-50, but where is the mechanism in the party? For the Kenya, where is the mechanism in their party? Where are the mechanisms in political parties? Let them tell us in our political party, this is how we guarantee that a third of our members that go to become candidates for elections are two-thirds. There is no party that has none. Even the ones led by women don't have, I don't think. So do you think it's deceptive when these party leaders, President Uru Kenyatta, Raila Odinga, you've mentioned also Kalonzo Musioka, uh, when bills or have been taken to parliament uh, with regards to implementation of the two-thirds gender rule and flopped, and then they come back and say, you know, we tried, the Attorney General tried, the MPs shut it down, our hands are tied. Of you, course. Do you think that's deceptive? It is. It is deceptive. And actually, it should be called what it is. It's outrightly deceptive. See how they have summoned members to disciplinary committees for not doing what the party, for not coming to a meeting. You were summoned for a meeting. You did not come. Come and explain yourself. You are in parliament by virtue of this political party. So if a party has a decision and it is a, pol it's a constitutional requirement, remember everybody from the president to the members of parliament, they swear an oath. They swear an oath to uphold the constitution. So it's, it, it's a, a rule of law issue. So you cannot feign at the, oh, my members did not vote. You get the voting list and you look at all your members and you ask them, bring them before the disciplinary committee. Why did you not vote? This was the party position. Why did you not vote? Let them explain themselves. So when you are called for a meeting, we can discipline you because you refused my call my command to attend a meeting but when you break the supreme law of the land from which you derive your authority and your power to sit in that in that uh, assembly there are no consequences what do you make of that abstaining from taking the vote it is uh, legislating according to your bias because these people they say mm, but what do women want eh, eh, it's not about what do women want imagine you have employed somebody and you give them instructions, this and this and this is what is required of you. And when you come back, they tell you, I didn't feel like doing it. Or I didn't think that you knew what you were talking about. What would you do? What would you do? Mm. So you would fire them? Yes. Yes. Parliament are not there for themselves. They are there for the people of Kenya. The people of Kenya promulgated the constitution. We're not saying men can't represent women's issues. We're saying the constitution requires that all of us be on this table as we're making these decisions. You can't decide that I have no right to be on this table when the constitution gives me a right to be on it. All right, Daisy and Danny, they're speaking to NTV's Olive Burrows about the two-thirds gender rule. That interview continues when we return after this break on NTV.
For a better tomorrow, don't forget to do the 1, 2, 3 with Colgate every night. I'm really glad that throughout this uh, period of COVID, we are seeing great innovations that have come out of this country, which is really key and, and growing in this sector, which has been affected. They now have actually begun to innovate. They've started uh, new films that are now being shown in different car parks where you can drive in and actually be able to experience and enjoy movies. So, 25th September 2020, the commission will be hosting uh, a premiere of a local film, Uradi, which will take place at the Galeria Mall drive-in, turn out in large numbers, and let's watch and support local content. As a country, we are actually taking these steps to move us forward. So vile nasema, wache ni kubatia statistics. Neku na gamia alfu moja mia tano. Tunakuwa drapo gamia na kuwa alfu sita. Alfu mbili na tengeneza leather, na tengeneza viatu, wallet, kibeti, na uza hapa, na batia wewe 50%. Ah, wache ni weke credit ni kupigia. Na mna gani wewe? Hii mabu ya kuizua na credit kila saa. Come on, nunuwa hiyo team ya waterphone. Calling Viber to Viber is zero shillings per minute. And it is not expensive. Only 2,999 Kenya shillings. Alwa hali wali wa 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 wa. Hata fudhali hiyo credit ikai ni nunuwe simu basi. Faibika leo na Waterphone for only 2,999 Kenya shillings. It will always be free to call Viber to Viber. Life will be there. Sona moja imetengenezo kwanjia speciali ili kupambana na maumivu kwa haraka. Sona moja ina aspirin kama kiungo. Sona moja, kitulizo kamili. Maumivu ya kizidi, pata ushauri wa daktari. Mavuno Fertilizers, a soil and crop specific fertilizer in Kenya, helps improve food security by improving crop yields through application of scientifically researched nutrition-based fertilizers. More than 500,000 farmers in Kenya can have easy access at affordable packs of 1 kg to 50 kg across major agro-dealers. Farmers who have used Mavuno Fertilizers have realized 30% more yield. Please feed your crop and soil with the best fertilizers for future prosperity. Call us today and learn how Mavuno Fertilizers is helping in increasing food production in in Africa. Karadina University wishes to announce to all new and continuing students that lectures of the first semester of the 2020-2021 academic year are ongoing. New Students University joining instructions and details on creation of e-learning account for all students are on the university website. Payment of requisite fees is a requirement. For more information, visit our website on www.karu.ac.ke or contact us on the details on your screen. Karatina University, inspiring innovation and leadership. nianza kutumia pika cooking oil hata kabla sijaanda chakula kila mtu nataka kuonja ni kuongeza zingine the court ruled that uh, ideally because parliament is not properly constituted because mm. there's yes, yes. the gender rule has not been met yes. then ideally it should be Dissolved yes. for dereliction of duty. If parliament fails to implement the necessary legislation according to the and within the time frame given by the courts, then the chief justice shall advise, not may, shall advise the president to dissolve parliament and parliament shall be dissolved. That is what Article 261, 5, 6, 7 says. And that is the article that we went to court on. And Justice Mativo gave the order 60 days. By the way, the day that we got that order, it was a landmark ruling. And uh, the media 
aptly captured it, the leader of majority at that time convened a press conference at the footsteps of parliament to ask who the courts thought they were to order parliament and that they were not going to do it. That's actually what they did. And they said, in fact, they are going to teach the judiciary a lesson. So it is a rogue. These guys are rogue. You know, you may see it only as the two-thirds gender principle, but we're dealing with a rogue house. One that will not be fettered within the confines of the law. They want to do what they want to do, how they want to do, when they want to do, and they are not to be told anything. Okay, what do you say to those who say there are no women issues, they are only Kenyan issues? See, women's issues are Kenyan issues. Of course they are women's issues. They are just women issues as they are men issues. There are many things that affect women singularly that do not affect men. Menstruation, men don't menstruate. It's a women's issue. It's a girl's issue. It's a serious issue. Look at the crisis right now that we are having with the teen pregnancies. Girls uh, sleeping with, with men to get money to buy pads. That's a women's issue. The state is able to provide condoms for free. Why are we not able to provide pads? You know, maternal care. Women give birth. So maternity, maternal health care, this is an issue for women, okay? Child health, this is an issue for women. Health care, in general, this is an issue for women. Availability of doctors, drugs, proximity to uh, nini, uh, health care institutions. Water, that's a women's issue because they are the ones predominantly who have to forego productive work to fetch water. Many of the girls, girl child, they are the ones who have to attend to many of these things before they attend to their education. You go to hospital, see how many, how many men do you see there sitting with children? This, it's a women's issue. Much of the unpaid care, the burden of care is on them. You know, when systems, when social services are not available, that burden falls to women predominantly. And I'm not saying that the men don't care but because it doesn't affect them they don't think about those issues you know it is like now those of us who are able-bodied many of the times when you're 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 setting up your system and everything how many times do you think that my guest might be a person with a disability do you think about that no you don't because it doesn't affect you but if the if you had somebody on your team who is who suffers who has a disability they will remind you they will remind you, you know, we can't do it upstairs because here there is no ramp and whatever, because they are affected by it. But when you just have men, we'll be having TVs, we'll be having to shiny, shiny things, you know, <laughs> roads, railways, you know, that are not really benefiting everybody, uh -huh. you know. Are you concerned that with this clamor for uh, changes to the constitution, that some of these gains, constitutional gains for women, could be clawed back? Of course. Oh my gosh. I, in fact, I think that is the first thing that they would deal with. How many times has the president called this whole thing a nuisance, these activists, wana sumbua sumbua thing, always litigation, what, what, what? Because we've gone to court, we have sued him about the cabinet, we have sued about uh, the nini, the, the parliament. Right now, parliament is facing the solution because of the two thirds gender rule. Of course, that would be the first thing that they would go for. Because remember, changing the constitution, the constitution can be changed, by the way. They, they, you can change the constitution. There are many ways to do it. There's parliamentary initiative. There's popular initiative. You can change. Mm. The only thing that you need to go to referendum for are for the protected clauses. And people need to remember that those clauses are protected for a reason. One, they, they, they safeguard against the excesses of power because those clauses are locked to fetter the duty bearers and to stop them from abusing their power. Why has there been this blatant disregard for what is stipulated in the constitution as far as two-thirds gender rule is concerned, as far as chapter six is concerned? The problem in Kenya is not the law. The problem in Kenya are the duty bearers who are supposed to implement the law. We are steeped in a culture of impunity and lawlessness. It has become a culture, a practice that has now become almost a norm. And so there's been a culture of leadership that is not accountable to the people. They have been operating without any accountability and citizens who didn't know how to hold leaders to account. 
never before in the history of independent Kenya can you go to court and actually sue parliament, sue the presidency for, not, for failure to abide by the law. This is something that these are freedoms that the constitution has given us. And those people who have been accustomed to wielding power authoritatively without accountability, using the public purse, as and how they felt without accountability to the citizen, ignoring Auditor General's reports, because even then, back th then, the Auditor General's report is simply a chronology of, of theft, pub theft of public resources, the same way we see today. But there was no accountability. Now, here we come, we have given the same characters, this very progressive constitution, to animate. And while it is true that you cannot bring everything into immediate maturation, but you can see intent. And I think that's one of the things that we should appreciate about uh, former President Mwai Kibaki. But now we have these ones who, eh, they do not want to be constrained by law. They want to do what they want, how they want. And people don't get it. The law gives us predictability. Olive. When we know what the law says, we know how things go. Kibaki was a gentleman that even at a time when those principles were not there, he guaranteed democratic expression, you know? And he allowed Kenyans to express themselves freely. Now, our political class are very touchy, touchy-feely about you not liking them, you know? So it's a case of, uh, so now, what? Are we not going to be allowed to think? to express ourselves, to disagree with duty bearers, including the president, and say, no, Mr. President, you are wrong. Because all the issues that people have gone to court for, it is because there have been violations of the law. And the courts, as interpreters of the Constitution, have agreed with the petitioners. Many of the petitions have been successful. As a result, the courts, the judiciary is paying a heavy price. They are really, really being hounded for upholding the rule of law for upholding the rule of law. There's a serious campaign against the judiciary. Look at how the law is being broken by the highest office in the land. He, the president has set the pace for breaking the law. All right, so what do we do then? Because you've raised, for example, the issue of the judiciary. You see the chief justice called press conference after press conference, looking almost helpless, saying we do not have the resources to effectively execute our mandate. If the chief justice is cutting the figure of a man helpless. What can we do as a citizen? We just continue doing what we're doing. We resist. We resist. We resist the lawlessness. We resist. We have to keep going to court. We have to keep standing up against them. Because you see, what do you do when you're faced with a bully? Because that's actually what they are. They are bullies. They have refused, they are, they have refused to abide by the law. But then they bully those who would dare to demand observance and adherence to the law. So we stand up to them. But Kenya is not your personal property. It's not your personal play playground. Kenya is governed by certain rules and you have a responsibility to obey those rules. Now the essence of a republic is that power, sovereign power belongs to the people of whom we are. We are the people, Olive. We are the people. However, when the people holding those offices fail to work for our benefit, we have a right and a responsibility to say, you know what? Actually, imagine you need to go. A plebiscite, they may decide that is what they want. However, we have the right to say no. We actually have the right to say, we don't agree with this. And we should be given the opportunity to express that right. Now, here they are. If they believe that their initiative is so good, and let us discuss it and let us decide for ourselves whether it is good or not. But any expression in the negative is met by violent uh, repression. What is so urgent about the BBI that it's okay for people to die of COVID, it's okay for people to die of hunger, it's okay for people to, um, you know, to be unemployed, to be desperate, but no, no, no. BBI is important. What is so important about the BBI? Don't tell us it's about elections and, and uh, violence against election. The violence is brought by these leaders. They are the ones. They instigate violence to up the ante for their negotiation. It is evil. It is wicked. 
and it's not a priority. I'm sorry. So at least if they showed us that they've implemented the constitution and they've really tried, that we would be seeing at least, yeah, maybe. But no, they have weakened independent institutions. They have weakened them, seriously. Attacked the judiciary, attacked the people, paralyzed. I mean, parliament is simply a marionette of the executive, you know? So what are they going to do? See, ni kumaliza Kenya basi. Candid views there by Daisy Amdani, a women's rights activist, speaking to NTV's Olive Burrows about the two-thirds gender principle. All right, I'm sure we will be hearing plenty more about that topic, and we invite you to contribute to the hashtag is the gender agenda. Some feedback here on Twitter, um, luck or something like it. You say, my wife tells me that there's nothing tangible that she's benefited from women reps. Now she's asking what to do to feel represented. And Jenga, Ernesto, you say, I think the issue of the two-third gender rule requires a revisit. All the solutions offered are a pipe dream. Gender equality means equal opportunities and not undue advantage in opportunity because of gender. Remember, for political seats, you can't dictate who wins. Uh, Sir Mark, you say, is it right for women to be awarded posts to attain the two-thirds gender rule? No way. IEBC, I believe, provides a leveled playground for every individual who wishes to vie. And um, another response here, Zach, you say, I've never understood why the other gender thinks it should be given positions. The two-thirds gender rule, what for? What are the ratios for? Let these women compete. So clearly uh, plenty of differing views about this key topic. All right, well, uh, we're taking another break now away from that conversation and it is our moment of calm, my favorite moment of the broadcast. This is an uh, Andean condor coming up on your screens, a massive South American bird that's part of the vulture family. On a cliff in Ecuador, a pair of the birds breed more successfully uh, than their usual one per year. And this has boosted hopes that the endangered species can be saved. After the break, Julian Zamboko brings you the business news, followed by Watson Karuma, who has the latest in sports. Safari come with color 500 and be free killer city. Get 500 MB free Kila Siku and never miss a moment. Dial star 544 hash to activate your offer. Browse Pilawas on Kenya's best network. Make sure that there is safety of the students when we are looking for a bus. That is why we are using the height and cell steel from Doshi. Jijenge na Doshi steel. Chuma yanguvu. Fresh Fry Premium Cooking Oil now has a new look and an advanced spout and seal. Triple refined, zero cholesterol and natural vitamin E. Fresh Fry, always hot friendly. Now it's even more cooking friendly. Fresh Fry, the premium cooking oil for healthy living. Jisot Nabonga is back and it's big. What's your style? Whether it's a phone with a great camera, a phone with all the latest apps, or just a phone with the right price to fit your pocket, we've got you. Jisot Nabonga Style Yako. By redeeming your bonga points for affordable smartphones at unbeatable prices at Safaricom shops and dealers countrywide or on masoko.com. Just dial star 126 hash, check your points balance and go shopping. Shopping. Hi everyone, welcome to the ITEL online launch. My name is MC Jesse. And we'd like to tell you more about the ITEL brand, new ITEL. SFT series, 6.3 dot notch screen, AI, selfie 2.0, gallery door, 2GB data bundle, ITEL TV, the earbuds, IFB 11, super smooth power, the XT. 
Potential Street. Let's join Aiton to enjoy a better life. Top Dressing Tea. Avoid top dressing during heavy rains as it will be eroded away. Weeding should be done before top dressing to ensure they don't regrow. More than 500,000 farmers in Kenya can have easy access at affordable packs of 1 kg to 50 kg across major agro dealers. Farmers who have used Mavuno fertilizers have realized 30% more yield. Please feed your crop and soil with the best fertilizers for future prosperity. Call us today and learn how Mavuno fertilizers is helping in increasing food production in Africa. When you buy a bar of Cadbury Dairy Milk Chocolate, you can help change the story. That's because we will use part of the proceeds to donate milk to less fortunate children across our beautiful country. Let us come together and show the generous spirit that is inside of all of us. Cadbury Dairy Milk. There's a glass and a half in everyone. Let's see what they're developing right now. Morphix pants with anatomic fit technology. New Morphix pants, an invention from babies for babies. You should also try Morphix. For more than 10 years now, One Acre Fund has worked with farmers across Kenya to give them access to quality seeds, fertilizer, and farming inputs through affordable financing options. To find out how you too can join the One Acre Fund program, dial star 689 hash. One Acre Fund, Mkulima, Kwanzaa. Best quality Keb certified steel. TMT steel bars, produced from the most modern machines and technology. Reliable and with the highest strength. Suitable for all types of construction. That is, high-rise buildings, bridges, houses and roads. Be Look for the Devki mark on a wider selling reinforcement, twisted and TMT rebars, which are KBS certified and have the diamond mark of quality. Devki Steel, Kenya's most trusted steel company. It is time to get down to business. Welcome, I am Julian Amboko. The consolidation of the Kenya Railways Corporation, Kenya Pipeline and the Kenya Ports Authority into the Kenya Transport and Logistics Network is facing fresh opposition within the corridors of justice. In a petition filed in court today, the Law Society of Kenya seeks to halt the consolidation exercise, arguing that there was no public participation in the process. The Society is challenging the August 2020 Executive Order No. 5 issued by President Uhuru Kenyatta, saying it flouts constitutional provisions the Kenya Transport and Logistics Network seeks to put in place a framework for the management, coordination and integration of the public port, railway and pipeline services under one umbrella. And on to matters agriculture. County governments are now faulting the Ministry of Agriculture over what they term as failure to consult them on matters regarding regulation of the tea sector and the ongoing reforms. According to Meru County Governor Kiraito Morongi, the said exclusion of the devolved governments from the development and implementation of the reforms disregards the fact that agriculture is a devolved function. Speaking during the weekend, Agriculture Cabinet Secretary Peter Munya defended the ongoing reforms, terming them as a step forward in the streamlining of the tea sector in the country. We, the Council of Governors, in our last meeting, wrote a letter to C.S. Munya protesting the manner in which he was implementing these reforms alone 
without consulting or working with governors and other leaders, yet we are the ones who are in charge of agriculture in our counties. Kwa ile TBO hiyo tumepeleka mbunge. Ile marekebisho tumepeleka. Tume create ile inaitwa a team board. Tunataka kurudi kwa ile team board. Hiyo ndio itatusaidia mambo hiyo mnasema ya marketing, mambo ya kuhakikisha bali addition inafanyika. Turudi pale tulikuwa tunafanya hata mambo ya research ya chai kwa sababu ni kwama. Kwa hivyo hiyo mbili iko na mambo ya team board. And away from matters regarding the agriculture sector, the National Treasury is set to release part of the 6.7 billion shillings budget allocation for the State Department of Fisheries to jumpstart the setting up of an ultra-modern tuna fish factory at the Liwatoni fishing port in the coastal region. This follows a directive by President Uhuru Kenyatta issued on Tuesday while he was touring the development projects at the coastal region. Rehabilitation works at the Liwatoni fishing port are earmarked for completion by March 2021 when all fishing vessels operate operating in the Kenyan waters will be required to land their catch at the Kenyan ports. Kenya's fishing and aquaculture sector was valued at 48.9 billion shillings in 2019. <laughs> And elsewhere, the Kenya Film Classification Board, KFCB, will extend more than 100 million shillings worth of support, both in cash and in kind, to players in the creative industry as part of its COVID-19 business continuity strategy. KFCB says cinema operators in the country have already lost an estimated half a billion shillings due to the COVID-19 disruptions, but the board says the industry is resilient and will quickly bounce back if uh, given the proper strategies are put in place. KFCB CEO Ezekiel Mutua says compliant local films will be given exemptions by the partner organizations and the government entities in order to promote the growth of local content. Those who had obtained licenses before COVID and now and were not able to continue with their projects because of COVID, when they come back, we don't have to, they don't need a new license. We just give them extension to complete their work. And the ones that are compliant with our, uh, our, our, our regulations uh, can also get exemptions uh, when they are going to, for example, the national parks. These are discussions that are ongoing. Like I said, when uh, we sign the MOU with the Kenya Civil Aviation Authority, we'll acquire the unmanned aircraft uh, systems or drones and keep them at NFC. And those who are coming to acquire them. So if you obtain a license from us and you need an, uh, a drone for you to be able to enhance the quality of your film, you get it for free. So there are so many ways where by cash and kind, we are hoping that it will be over 100 million in terms of the support that we are giving to the industry. Quite a shot in the arm and a relief for creatives in the country. That takes us to the close of business. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. Eta pare. Small pare. Eh, leo umenifanya niamini mtu anaweza mea ndevu kwa magoti. Hi everyone. Welcome to the ITEL online launch. My name is MC Jesse. And we'd like to tell you more about the ITEL brand. New ITEL. STT series. 6.3 dot notch screen. AI, selfie to point you. Gallery door. 2GB data bundle. ITEL TV. The earbuds. IFB 11. Super slim power. The extensions to... Let's join ITEL to enjoy a better life. I help women find independence by training them in fish farming. Oh, it's tough on my back, joints, and can cause headaches. Panadol Extra relieves multiple types of pain. Panadol Extra, now with new Optizop technology to fight multiple tough pains with three times more pain relieving medicine in the first 30 minutes when you need it most. Seeing them support themselves makes any pain worth it. If symptoms persist, seek medical advice. Trust condoms who are true.
the event that you would like to verify the genuineness of the certificate, uh, what you need to do is to uh, dial star 352 hash. Uh, you can also uh, download uh, the Aki app onto your phone. If by any chance you happen to sell your motor vehicle, um, it will be important that you contact your insurance company for cancellation of the, of the, of the certificate that you're holding. NTV Sport in association with Showmax. Welcome to NTV Sport. I'm Watson Karuma. Reigning Olympic gold medalists, current and former world champions will be in action at the Kip Kano Classic set for the 3rd of October. Olympic and world 3000 Mrs. Stipolch's champion Conceslas Kipruto and Abraham Kibi Watt are in the list of competitors released today. Former women's world champ Eunice Soom will also be in action in her 40 800 meters race as is world bronze medalist Ferguson Rotich in the men's race. World champ Helen Obiri is also lined up to compete in the 5,000 meters women's race. On the field, former world javelin champion Julius Yego will also be in action. <laughs> Member NTV will air the World Continental Gold Tour live from the Nyan National Stadium on the 3rd of October and then a day later the London Marathon where Eliud Kipchoge and Vivian Cheriot will be among those competing in the streets of London. Now the Deputy President William Ruto is calling for the equal treatment of all sports people donning the national colors. The Deputy President says people living with disabilities for example should not be paid less than their able-bodied counterparts who receive a million shillings for winning a gold medal. DP Ruto acknowledged the contribution from sports people in placing Kenya on the world map. He spoke during a meeting with people with disabilities, uh, their leaders from across the country. Kila mwana sporti wanapo shiriki katika michezo ya kimataifa wakipata ushindi kuna vile serikali ya Kenya itawashughulikia na tumesema for those who get gold they will be paid a million shillings for those who get uh, silver they will get 500,000 and those who get bronze they will get 250,000 na hatutaki kuwe na ubaguzi na hata watu wanaoishi na ulemavu are not an exception they are sportsmen they are sportswomen they are sports people and they deserve equal treatment Kenyan champions Gormahi officially began training ahead of the new local and continental season. Kogala, coached by Steve Pollack, will represent Kenya in the CAF Champions League from November for the fourth time. Gore's latest signing from Burundi, that is striker Jules Ulimwengu, who joined on a two-year deal, was part of that team. The acquisition of Ulimwengu brings to three the number of foreign players Kogalo has signed. Others include Cameroonian midfielder, Bertrand Kung Fu and Ugandan forward Tito Okello. Gorma has been uh, training in, light, in, in uh, small groups of about five people uh, in uh, anticipation that maybe in the next two weeks uh, the ministry will allow us to train full time. We can see that the, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is, is, is flattening. Matarajo yangu Kenya ni kusaidi sana na wenzangu. Tunachukua ubingwa na matches za competition tunafika mbali. Now, former champions Manchester City began their quest to regain the English Premier League title by beating their host Wolves 3-1. Kevin De Bruyne put City ahead in the 20th minute from this spot before Phil 
Foden added the second uh, in the 32nd minute. Raul Jimenez pulled one back for Wolves 12 minutes from time. Gabriel Jesus says injury time effort sealed victory for Pep Guardiola's side. In the other results of the night, Aston Villa registered a 1-0 victory over Sheffield United, who played for 78 minutes with 10 men. Ezri Consul's second half header gave Aston Villa their first win of the season. Sheffield boss Chris Wilder questioned referee Graham Scott's decision to send off John Egan early in the game and not show a red card to Villa's target for conceding a penalty, which John Lundstrom saw saved by Villa debutant in uh, goalkeeper Emiliano Martinez with the score at nil nil. Aston Villa's two giant centre halves combine. And Esri Konsa gets the key touch. That offers the Let's go to Italy now, and AC Milan veteran forward Zlatan Ibrahimovic scored twice as his team started the Italian Serie A campaign with a 2-0 win over Bologna at the San Siro. The 38-year-old broke the deadlock with a towering header in the 35th minute before adding the second with a penalty in the 51st minute. Milan extended their unbeaten run to 15 games in all competitions as they started where they left off last season, suggesting they are capable of battling for the Champions League spot. Milan, what a rip with Skorupski in that Bologna goal. Ibrahimovic, powerful and precise. Milan's enigma, Milan's inspiration. Zlatan Ibrahimovic has a double. Well, the goalkeeper chooses the right way, but the thing that beats him is the height. Well, the unmatchable Zlatan there wraps up NTV Sport. Thank you very much for your time. Have a lovely night. Sport in association with Showmax. And the sports news closes NTV tonight on this Tuesday night. Flora Antieno has been our sign language interpreter. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. Join me again tomorrow night at 9 p.m. as we bring you team coverage Wednesday. And our focus is on the education situation in the country. Thanks for joining us and do have yourselves a lovely night. This is NTV. I help women find independence by training them in fish farming. Oh, it's tough on my back, joints, and can cause headaches. Panadol That's Extra relieves multiple types of pain. If symptoms persist, seek medical advice. <laughs> Uh, Trust condoms who are true. Nearly one in three children across Kenya do not have the proper nutrition to grow. But when you buy a bar of Cadbury Dairy Milk Chocolate, you can help change the story. That's because we will use part of the proceeds to donate milk to less fortunate children across our beautiful country. Let us come together and show the generous spirit that is inside of all of us. Cadbury Dairy Milk. There's a glass and a half in every one.
this week on Lit 360. I woke up to film and I said, each chance to miss you is a chillier easy. I am very prayerful. Binguni na yana amini ni tayona. Na venye na cheki tu kendele hivi, nita sema yes, bana. Na mi spendi ikitu sana. Kwa hizi ni mistari, mi spendi ikitu sana. Get ready. Mwano me ni proto kwa Buddha. Hata ukiwa na do, luga mwini. Leba. Kwa hizi nukambia, mwede mademo la pwena mba komedia. Lit 360 in association with Trust Condoms. Form yangu ni trust, real. Trust Condoms, who are true. Boy, eta pare. Small pare. Eh, le umenifanya ni amini mtu anayaza mea ndevu kwa magoti. Hi everyone, welcome to the ITEL online launch. My name is MC Jesse. And we would like to tell you more about the ITEL brand. New ITEL. S T series. 6.3 dot notch screen. Headline 72.0. Gallery door. 2GB data bundle. ITEL TV. The ear pads. IFB 11. Super slim power. The extension screen. Let's join ITEL to enjoy a better life. Dr. Rabbit, is that you? Yes, it is.